So my, talk, my story today is about a rather interesting period that it has in one sense ended uh, in its extremity, but it's still we're feeling the implications of those decisions. It's in the 1990s, it's basically in the United States, although it certainly is true of Europe and in Japan with the European Patent Office and the Japanese Patent Office. And that is the, the, the period when we saw a rather large number of genes, particularly human genes, being patented in the United States and in Europe and in Japan to a, to a lesser extent. Um, over the past, say, 30 years, uh, the U.S. government uh, has, been, has promoted the commercialization of research conducted with federal funding with the view of turning that funding over to benefits over to U.S. taxpayers, and so the argument went. Now, there are two rather famous acts, both from the 1980s, the Stevenson-Weidler uh, Technology uh, Innovation Act, which enables federal institutions, particularly the National Institutes of Health, uh, to enter into licensing agreements with commercial entities, when the ideas for those, for those technologies originated with governmental scientists. The first. By far the more important of the two acts is the Bayh-Dole Act, also of 1980, which cedes to universities and small businesses the right to claim intellectual property, and it permits universities uh, and colleges and small businesses to reap the benefits of intellectual property via licensing agreements or and royalty fees. And that's when, in the 1980s, you have a boom in technology transfer offices of American universities. Uh, it became a staple of tier one research institutions. Um, in a similar fashion, the federal courts have been very supportive of biotech patents, particularly genetic patents, with a view to encourage economic and technological growth. Uh, certainly true in the United States. And the interesting thing is I get asked a lot, is there kind of a Democrat-Republican divide on this? And the answer is no, I mean, not at all. Uh, one of the strongest uh, 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 proponents of biotechnology is Bill Clinton. And you see this with his, or the, the, the Bill Clinton's uh, administration uh, directive of biotechnology of January 2001, which is one of the last things his administration did before George W. ascended the throne. Um, and it clearly and definitively set out the importance of gene patents to the U.S. economy. As a matter of fact, William Hazeltine, but we'll hear more about him in just a minute, who's the former president of Human Genome Sciences, called the administration's guidelines on gene patents, quote, the Magna Carta of biotechnology. <laughs> they clearly establish in the most dramatic fashion the patentability of human genes, unquote. And the bioethicist and critic, Sheldon Krimsky, agreed that this is exactly what the Clinton administration had ruled. Quote, if anything, the document reinforces the move toward economic colonization of the human genome and other biochemical substances found in nature, unquote. And that directive of 2001 really reflected the EU's biotech directive of July 1998 that became effective in, in, in 2000, although I think the last country to sign off was France in 2004. So, the EU isn't as united as you probably all well know here, but far more better than I, as united as one might hope, or not hope in your case. Maybe. The scientific, of course, context, this is the Human Genome Project, a project, an international project, spearheaded by the United States, of course, the Sanger Institute of Cambridge has played a huge role as well. Uh, 3.10 to the ninth base pairs of DNA was to be sequenced with 3 times 10 to the ninth beta dollars. So it was a sale, one dollar nucleotide back in the 1990s. Um, and the goal was to basically look, to begin to understand diseases as genetic entities with a move, it was hoped, by pharmaceutical companies to shift away from a chemical treatment of drug to a gene therapy treatment of drug. And we've talked about why that hasn't been so successful as hoped, uh, if you're interested. Um, and this Human Genome Project gave rise to a number of DNA sequencing companies, such as Millennium, Insight, HGS, or Human Genome Sciences, many of which really did not do any pharmaceutical research at all. They were basically what we call gene jockeying. They would find important gene sequences in, in the Human Genome Project information and then move to patent them so that companies or institutions, profit, nonprofit organizations wanting to do research on those genes would pay these sequencing companies royalties or enter into licensing agree agreements with them, yeah, with them. So with these sequence companies armed with the new array of automatic sequencers that people like Leroy Hood had established at Caltech, uh, the hunt for finding human genes had officially begun. 
So what's at stake? Clearly, an awful lot. Um, there are interesting questions being raised in the United States that the fears that patentees will block downstream diagnostic and therapeutic research. That's the case with the CCR5 gene that I'll talk about today. There's also been the complaint of a number of scientists, many of whom are Nobel laureates. The one good thing about being on the is we have a dream team. If we just took like a quiz in molecular biology, we'd kick Miriam's butt. Right? We have John <laughs> Solston, we have about three Nobel laureates. Right? We have some pretty powerful power hitters on it. Uh, and they've all, and John Solson in particular, wrote a deposition for the ACU saying, look, that gene patents, the, the, myriad, the, the myriad patents, BRCA1, BRCA2, breast cancer 1 and 2 genes, have actually, actually hindered research on diagnostics uh, for breast cancer throughout, throughout the world. Um, and given in the United States, where healthcare is not state-run, uh, the question of a escalating uh, health cost, giving, adding to that licensing fees and, 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 and royalties, what in the world will happen other than a collapse of our system that has pretty much collapsed. The NHS, I mean, I know people kind of from the United States run the NHS, but what we got, uh, don't do backflips over it, believe me. If you're a billionaire, it's great, but, you know. As I said, I do my work pro bono public health. The myriad, the myriad expert witnesses get great health care. Uh, there's also, ironically, and this is great work by Mildred Cho of Stanford, with patent gene patents, there's actually an increase in secrecy, right? And that's anathema to what patents are supposed to be. Patents are, an, are, are the opposite of trade secrets. It's a quid pro quo. You divulge what it, you know, the, the, what you have, how it is, you, you know, what the best use is that the, the general public can benefit, and the government will protect that from it's now in the United States 20 years from the, the date of, of application. Well, it turns out that laboratories in the United States who are working on diagnostic tests for diseases actually say that secrecy has thwarted their research. That, that if you're working in a lab that's interested in patenting some aspect of the research, you actually are less likely to share the results, and you're also less likely to, to publish the results until after the patent's been granted. Right, so it's a very interesting move. And we were talking about Merton, and this is the Merton comes up. I mean, Merton in the, in the normative structure of science of 1942, he says on the one hand, one of the ethos of science is communism, that it's a shared collective, right, that the, the, the collective of humanity is supposed to, to benefit. Patents, in one sense, might be creative, but also patents can lead to a monopoly of knowledge, which he warned about. And indeed, that, and he railed against that aspect of, or that kind of application of patents, that monopoly of knowledge very strongly in, in, in his work in, in 1942. So the argument of biotech companies and pharmaceuticals is they're going to look, if you take away our gene, pat, gene patenting, we're not going to do research on it. We are, after all, not philanthropic, go figure, right? Um, and so the interesting point is, and I'm sure, as a historian and as just someone who reads a lot, uh, I'm sure that if we took away gene patents, there's going to be change in the landscape of what gets done, but I don't think, we can talk about this in the discussion here, I don't think it's doomsday scenario. And indeed, it's something that a lot of people have assumed without actually studying it. So as a historian, I'd say, rather than assume that this, this is the case, let's talk about how we'll investigate what will happen, should this be indeed be the case, using historical examples and using modern examples for precisely that reason. Um, so as a number of people in science and technology studies, and in, in, in history of, of medicine, I've talked about this is the age of biocapitalism, right? So it's Foucault meets Karl Marx, what is the problem? <laughs> um, and so the notion now that molecules, so going back to Das Kapital, that molecules, biomolecules, including genes, become entities of commerce, right? they become entities of, of, of capital, right? And going back to Foucault's History of Sexuality, Volume 1, it's very similar to biopower. Uh, referring to the ability of nation states to calculate subjects' bodies with a, with a, with a means to control and manipulate. Right? So it's an interesting time, and my story today fits squarely into that age of, of biocapital because it's a story about a CCR5 gene. It's a story about, you know, it's a fun story, and being a historian, we love fun stories, but it has a very interesting moral. So my, my project basically does two things. And, and the first bit I'll talk about today, which is how is it that molecular biology has really challenged intellectual property law in the United States? Intellectual property law is not able to deal with gene patenting. I don't care. I don't, you know, and I'm, you know, great lawyers have tried to discuss the word, not discuss, yell at me with this. Um, I just think that the application of chemistry to, to genes, intellectual property law from chemistry, many of which was drafted in, you know, in Germany in the late 19th century, uh, is not really all that applicable. 
and is highly problematic. So we'll talk about kind of this notion of how, into, how molecular biology has changed intellect, has, has, has kind of challenged intellectual property law, how intellectual property law has challenged the content and conduct of molecular biology, so both kind of some, I don't want to be a Latorian because I'm not a Latorian, but I mean co-construction, co-production is popping in my head, so forgive me for I know not what I do. I'm talking to the camera. Um, <laughs> Um, so I'll talk about that. And it's also particularly with this gene, the CC, CCR5 is a great example of that. But it also turns out that this gene has a very fascinating story when it comes to the theories of race. Because it turns out there is a cline, as a molecular biologist would say, there is a high percentage of people from Estonia and Northern East Europe who have what's known as the Delta 32 mutation, which I'll talk about, that decreases, there are bits in, in, in England, uh, but, it, but as you go down to southern Europe, it decreases dr drastically. We have yet to find a Delta 32 mutation in the African population, which begs really fascinating questions. What do you mean by an African population? The Africans have by far the most diverse genetic background, and there are very interesting questions about race and the way in which molecular biology has challenged notions of race. Uh, in very fascinating ways. And this is the story about this because as soon as they heard about the Delta 32 mutation, population geneticists did these samples and you get some really interesting notions of how molecular biologists think about race in very fascinating ways. But alas, I'm not going to talk about it because then the booze will get old. I'm not going to but feel free to ask. Well, you can also ask during booze. It's not like ASP. So like I said, I'm a historian for all my sins, which there are many. Uh, so we like stories, and this is a fun story to tell. So I start out, the first half of the show is to tell you the story, and the second half of the show is then to look at this applicant, kind of this dynamic relationship between intellectual property and molecular biology. So the story starts uh, in, in July of 1992, um, and it's Washington, D.C., so I guarantee the day it happened it was about 100 degrees and a million percent humidity. And a very controversial character, J. Craig Venter, decided to resign from the National Institutes of Health. He, he, he was the king of human gene jockeying. He had discovered more genes than any other lab, all other labs combined. He had a huge fight uh, with people in the, uh, in the NIH, uh, particularly Watson, and if you fight with a Nobel laureate and you're not one, life sucks, so he quit. Uh, he quit because he got an interesting office, offer from the late Wallace Steinberg, who was a venture corporate capitalist and the CEO of a major health corporation, healthcare investment corporation, who called up Craig because he had heard that Craig was, was rather unhappy at the NIH with a rather lucrative offer. And that offer was, look, I'll let you head up an institute. I'll give you $85 million. This doesn't happen to historians, by the way. I'm not a philosopher. So no, no. Uh, I'll give you $85 million. Actually, it's 70 but Craig Venter, if you ever want to like negotiate, get Craig Venter to be here because he got it up to $85 million. And the idea was that Craig would head up this nonprofit organization called TIGER, the Institute for Genomic Research. And he basically sequenced the genes, right? And the idea was there would be no meddling from a university administration or the NIH, which Craig thought was great, right? I mean, no one's going to bother me. I get my automatic sequencers. I can find as many of these genes as I want. Well, it turns out there was a hitch. If you get paid 85 million, there's going to be a hitch. And the hitch was that there was a requirement that Tiger send the information to Human Genome Sciences, which was a for-profit company, HGS, which still exists, that's head up by the rather flamboyant molecular biologist, William Hazeltine, who's famous because he always tells everyone he married a model. Um, he's also famous in the actor's category. Uh, he's also famous for his work on HIV. He was a professor, before he decided to become uh, an entrepreneur, he was a professor of virology at Harvard Med School. Very, very brilliant. Scandalous, but very brilliant molecular biologist. So the idea was that Venter would send uh, HGS these sequences every day, right? And HGS had the right to, to, to peruse the sequence for six months, i.e., Venter was not allowed to make the sequence public for six months, right? Which is technically against the Bermuda Accords for those who know the Human Genome. If you were part of the Human Genome Project, which Venter was with Tiger, you had to give your data in within 24 hours. There's a huge fight about that, but it's a different story. Now, if Venter thought, sorry, if, if Hazeltine, or one of the scientists, a human genome scientist, said, hey, look, that looks like an interesting gene, i.e., it was a gene that was related to some disease, used with therapeutics, with diagnostics, HGS had the right to, to have an extension, exclusion, extension clause, which said, you may not publish it for another 12 months, meaning that there could be in total 18 months from the time in which HGS got the sequence until the time in which Tiger was able to make that 
sequence available. At first, Venter thought that this was going to be a few genes, so he wasn't upset. To give the devil his due, I mean, it's like Beelzebub versus Lucifer, right? I mean, I, Hazeltine's even more sinister than Venter. <laughs> I'm probably going to go to jail for this. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing I have ACLU. Because um, Hazeltine was out, so because Venter actually said, look, you know, I'm, you know we, this is public, you know, this public, uh, this part of the human genome product we need. He also wanted, he also wanted the kudos, he wanted that, is what Shapin talks about in his new book, rather interestingly, that cool, that dual kind of entrepreneur versus scientist. They wanted both, best of both worlds. And that was very difficult to negotiate. Venter did not negotiate that very successfully. Um, so Hazeltine was invoking the extension clause on almost every gene, that every sequence that Venter was sending. And there's a great, great line that, that Hazeltine says, if you had Craig and I were ever on the same page, you didn't understand that he was my booster rocket, and that's it. Right. And that's published on one and open it, right. Um, so it turns out that one day, in, in 1993, um, uh, late 93, Tiger sends a rather interesting sequence to that's analyzed by Yee Lee and Stephen Rubin of Human Genome Sciences. And it turns out that they used, computer, used computers. In the age of computers, you basically look at a gene, the computer sends the information, and that there are two, uh, there are now more, but there are two algorithms that were used back in the, the, wild, the wild 1990s, FASTIT and BLAST. There were computer algorithms that could take gene sequences and compare very quickly what the percentage of homology was. And with a certain percentage of homology, the idea was that you could deduce by computer search, by computer analysis alone, what the function of the, gene, of the protein was that that gene code. And it turns out that you know, we, it's hot. we don't know exactly, because human genome science has revealed nothing, as I'll talk about in a second. We don't know how much biochemistry Yi or Rubin did, Lee or Rubin did. Um, most molecular biologists say they did nothing. They simply did the computer algorithmic search. Most gene patterns on human genes have been done through sequence homologies. Now, this is, so this is, in a sense, rather emblematic of gene patterns. It's not an anomaly. Um, so they do the standard routines, and they found out that there's a 71% homology between this gene that they call the HDGNR10 gene, which will change its name, thank goodness, in just a minute, uh, to a chemokine receptor called MCP1, or monocyte chromatic protein. And indeed, there's a, there, in some regions, there's an 82% homology. Well, bet the farm, it's a chemokine receptor. So that's what they put in their patent application. What in the world are chemokines? Chemokines are very small proteins, they're cytokines, and they act as messengers between cells, particularly between cells of the immune system, like blood cells. So they're important for wound trafficking, for allergic responses, for arthritis. If you're a pharmaceutical company, you can ding, 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 right? These are great, great things to own patents about. Um, so when they applied for the patent on the 6th of June, 1995, they basically wrote in the patent for, its, for its, the claim a very broad utility claim. I'll, read, I'll quote it to you. Quote, uh, a tool for identifying antagonists and agonists to such polypeptides and methods of using the agonists and antagonists therapeutically to treat conditions related to the underexpression and overexpression of the G-protein chemokine receptor polypeptides respectively. Unquote. That makes me miss reading German. Yeah. Goethe, when you have to read a patent application, read patents are horrible things to read, because many of them are horribly written. So basically what that line, what that enablement says, we're going to use this gene, and we're going to screen for chemicals that can bind to the, to the protein, that causes a physiological effect, a cascade, and those molecules that bind to that protein, that interrupt, that do not cause the effect, right? So what they're, what they're applying a patent for is a screening device. But they also say, oh, and by the way, it's this gene, it's 80% of, of any similar nucleotide to this gene. Woohoo! I should have been intellectual property, I'd be rich now. <laughs> uh, and also the product of the gene, right? So if you're a pharmaceutical company wanting to create a molecule, and what is the end of the show, the end of the story I'll get to, that binds to that receptor, like a monoclonal antibody, you've got a pen. Human genome science is royal. So, bah, that's nothing. It gets a lot better than that. So, it turns out that the, they sit back and they wait. They, again, they apply for the patent in 1995. The patent is granted on the 15th of February 2000. It's about average time back in the old days, about five years. 
It's also important to remember that a lot of people working at the USPTO were not electrical biologists in the 90s. They're electrical engineers. They're chemical engineers. They're mechanical engineers. Right? So a lot of interesting things get pushed through the patent office in the 1990s. And I've actually, I found out the person, because it's public knowledge, who, who well, we can talk about this, who agreed, who, who, who approved the patent. So H human genome scientists have the application on file. They sit back. And when it gets the day after the patent's granted, so on the 16th of February 2000, they announced to the world that they have the patent for HDGNR10. And that article, that announcement, made news in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, in the LA Times. Now, why the hell would anyone care that HDGNR10 was patented by human genome science? It turns out a lot had happened from the moment in which the patent was filed in 95 until the patent was granted, approved in 2000. And that's because some really high-powered molecular biologists at the NIH, the Aaron Diamond Age Research, part of Rockefeller University in Manhattan, NYU School of Medicine, Penn School of Medicine, and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, had been working on, on chemokines and also HIV infections. So people like Robert Gallo and Paolo Lusso of the NIH found that chemokines secreted by CD4 lymphocytes, which are white blood cells that have the CD4 uh, um, uh, receptor on them, suppressed HIV-1 re uh, replication, and in 1996, February 96, Ed Berger, also of the NIH, found that there was a receptor called Fusin, or CXCR4, that actually increased, the, that enabled the infection of cells of HIV-1. So the 90s, the mid-90s, are actually a critical period when you have two important movements within molecular biology converging, namely chemokine research and HIV. Um, footnote, the people at Human Genome Sciences are doing none of this research. People on the patent know nothing about this. I mean, they're following it, but they didn't contribute anything to it. And it turns out that that code, that receptor, HDGNR10, which is the last time I'll call it that because it's a pain to say it all the time, uh, was the co-receptor for HIV. Right. We now call it CCR5, or chemokine receptor 5. Did HGS know that at the time of that? No. Not at all. Right. Um, they were very happy, however, that it was the CCR5. Right. Now, one of the major reasons, is actually, there, there are actually six papers, from, five papers, sorry, from those labs. This is Tatiana Drogic's paper, HIV-1 entry into CD4 cells is mediated by the chemokine receptor. Back in the old days, it was called CCCKR5. We now have new nomenclature, uh, and it's now called CCR5. Um, and it turns out one of the reasons, and, uh, so, uh, for those that are like a biologist, they can do backflips. The first one is fusing, it, it, it's a glycoprotein uh, receptor. It's a seven transmembrane protein. This is a cytoplasm. These are CD4 or cells, which are lymphocytes with a CD4 membrane. This is the CCR5 co-receptor. Um, and I'll talk about the difference between those two receptors later on at the end of the show. This is the actual uh, diagram representing how HIV-1 infection works in 30 seconds or less. HIV has a glycoprotein 120, which is a co-protein recognized by the host cell. The primary receptor is the CD4. The CD4 attaches to the glycoprotein 120, causes a conformation shift, a change. Another glycoprotein 41 is up there, that red one up there. With that stereochemical shift, CCR5, the co-receptor recognizes another part of the glycoprotein. That then signals the virus to go through an endocytosis. And so that AIDS is a retrovirus, meaning it's made up of RNA. Uh, it shoots its RNA with the, with the reverse transcriptase, which is the enzyme that makes DNA from RNA into the host cell. It intercalates itself into the host genome. So every time our, those cells reproduce, it reproduces the viral DNA, and then the virus then assembles, and then uh, gets, uh, after a while, in a very fascinating, complicated, and very often individual specific way, will then burst out of the cell and infect other cells. Right. So that receptor, that's what they have the patent on. Right. So you can imagine that this was grand. And, and one of the reasons why they made so the, just a, yeah. uh, this is a dia dia diagrammatic sketch of what I just showed you. It turns out that one of the reasons why these labs made such, pro such you know, quick um, progress was that a number of self-proclaimed promiscuous gay white men who had lovers who had died of AIDS, like a decade before, were HIV positive, but not AIDS positive. 
right? Meaning that there's HIV in the blood, but they have never had symptoms of AIDS. Now, immunologists are pretty smart going, wow, man, this is interesting. It turns out that they had something known as a delta 32 mutation, delta D for deletion. That's the wild type. You've got to like molecular biology where wild is normal. Uh, and so you can see, and just remember that disulfide bridge, the two cysteine residues, so we could come back to that in a second. Those who have the delta 32 mutation, the protein is never, is never expressed on the surface of the cell. So if you think of receptors and, and, and ligands as lock and key, the key is the HIV. Well, the lock is on the wrong side of the door so that the HIV uh, virus can never infect the cell. You can infect someone else, but you will not come, I mean, footnote. There are HIV strains that well, you can get, HIV-2, uh, and there's also, there, there have been people who have Delta 32 mutations that have very rare forms of HIV. So it's not, like, false, but by and large, you have a very strong resistance to HIV-1. Again, because the receptor is, is not located where it should be. So, and as a result of the Delta 32 mutation, and indeed, the Delta 32 mutation, and also, the researcher, one of the groups working on this was Euroscreen, the Free University of Brussels. It's a, a company offshoot of the university. Um, and, and collaborators at the UPenn School of Medicine, they're the ones who identified, they patented the Delta 32 mutation. And not only did they patent the Delta 32 mutation, they also filed the patent for the CCR5 gene, not knowing that human genome sciences had already filed for the patent. So this is in like 97. So the, the 95, HGS files the patent, 97, Euroscreen file, files the patent. You don't have to divulge whether or not you filed the patent. Patent patents only become common knowledge once they're granted. Right. So this is interesting. It's an interesting wrinkle to the story. But it gets better because, as it turns out, so actually, I'm going to go, go into this first. Uh, so after, after the patents announced in 2000, the human genome scientist, President Hazeltine, says, look, the, quote, the discovery of the CCR5 gene is yet another example of the power of genomics approach to drug discovery. It was one of the many genes we found early on in our discovery program. Interesting notion, the definition of discovery. Uh, experiments confirmed that CCR5 played a key role in the biology of the immune system and as an AIDS virus receptor. Remember now that HIV was never mentioned in the application. What's the response? Wall Street, the company sourced, uh, stocks soared. They soared 41% in two days after the announcement of this discovery, adding nearly $1 billion to their coffers about two months after the announcement. Um, Hazel team made it clear that despite not mentioning HIV in the application, any company using this receptor for drug treatment programs after the 15th of February 2000 without paying HGS royalties would be fined, quote, not just damages, but double and triple damages. Now, to be fair, to give the devil his due, he did say if you're working for a nonprofit organization, he would make sure that you could afford using it because of the importance of HIV. Right? Now, this is important because one aspect of intellectual property law, there is no equivalent. In the United States, we have fair use for copyright. Right? That if for educational purposes, a certain percentage of books you can photocopy without buying a book. There is no such thing as patent. That's up. The, the, what the patent, ha what one does with the patent is totally up to the discretion of the patent holder, the patentee. In this case, it was the goodwill of Hazeltine saying, look, if you're working for a nonprofit, we're not, we're not going to nuke you. If you're working for a pharmaceutical company, then we'll nuke you. We'll talk about this in a minute. Now, Wall Street welcomed the news. A lot of scientists didn't know. Indeed, many were incensed. Gallup protested. Gotta love Gallup. Quote, I'm being somewhat wrong. If the patent office awards a patent to someone who clones a gene, even though they have no notion of its function and no real use of it and no idea of its use, that would be like me saying, I found a fungus, therefore I should get credit for penicillin. Okay. Dan Lippman, a colleague of mine at NYU, one of the scientists who determined that the HIV recognizes the CCR5 as a co-receptor, was also dismayed. Quote, now you have companies coming from a completely different direction and not even trying to understand the function before seeking patent. They can just sit there and wait for others to do research for them. Um, unquote. Now, Hazeltine, of course, was quick to defend his company's research and financial interests. Quote, this is one of my favorite quotes of all time. You're rewarded for speculation in America. If you teach what to do and you're right, you don't have to show it yourself. You're rewarded for intelligent and correct guessing. The patent office does not reward perspiration, they reward priority. They don't care if someone spent 20 years to find, interesting word, to find an invention or 20 minutes. 
we did real biology. Right. A month later, the controversy gets even better. Not only did HGS fail to list HIV as one of the, one of the uses of the gene, one of the functions of the gene, in a rush to patent the gene, they got the sequence wrong. That happens a lot more than you may think. I interviewed people who want to be anonymous at the, at the USPTO, and some said they would not be surprised if a third to half of the gene patents are incorrect. Right? In America, you're allowed to make changes to the patent even after the patent's granted to change the sequence to make it correct as long as no one's challenged the patent. Right? It's different in Europe, as we'll talk about, and that's famous with the bracket one. Uh, that got reversed because of an incorrect sequence. It turns out that there are four nucleotides they got wrong, and all four of them would result in amino acid shifts. Right? And the most important one, again, this is the wild type, uh, the most important is, actually, I forgot, I have a laser. Oh, I have a laser. Yeah, like the, the red button is so, touchdown. I, can't, I, mean, I forgot I had to go and see how being a laborer, I don't like going that. So, <laughs> um, so this, this one right here was replaced by another amino acid. For those of like a biology 101, you know that cysteine, cysteine disul form disulfide bridges, which is totally is actually critical to the protein folding, the structure of the protein. Then, and it's those, the structure of the protein that HIV-1 recognizes. So without that cysteine right there, this protein has a totally different folding pattern. So molecular biologists aren't stupid. John Moore, who's now at Wild Cornell, he was at Rockefeller at the time, said, hey, look, let's take the sequence that actually has the patent Right, we'll, we'll, we'll synthesize that. We'll express protein, see if HIV-1 hybridizes. It did not hybridize at all. It's a, totally, it's a gene that codes for a totally different protein. Well, it turns out that Hazel team did not despair. Despite the errors, which they openly admitted, they argued, look, we are entitled to any and all royalties. So, God, this can't be right. And this is the argument. He says, look, technically, any errors in the company's description as corresponding protein are irrelevant. Why? Because their patent doesn't refer to the sequence in the patent description. It refers to the gene that's put on deposit at the American Tissue Culture Center in Manassas. You never go there if you don't have to, Virginia. <laughs> so the argument is, look, and he actually said, this is a quoting Hazelton, because I can't make this crap up. When we file a patent, we don't claim the sequence as the invention. The invention we claim is the gene we deposit at the ATCC. We know that our sequence and most sequences are not perfect. <laughs> That's great. Anyone who wishes can go to the ATCC, because what the hell, you got nothing else better to do, go to Manassas, Virginia. It's the same as in the olden days when inventors used to deposit a little model of their invention. It's not quite true, but it's interest, an interesting argument. Uh, to make the story even more interesting, on the 10th of September 2002, or two years after HGS got the patent, the USPTO also awarded the Belgian company Euroscreen for the same gene, a patent. So how, how can you do that? So well, we make mistakes. So I then said, what how, I tried, I, 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 I've called human genome scientists, I've emailed them, I've written them. You hear nothing from them. They're not talking. I called Euroscreen, I spoke in French, I left message in English, I even faked Dutch. I wasn't sure, I cover all my face. Um, never heard anything. We do know that when the gene was announced, Euroscreen said clearly this is going to lead to an interesting infringement case with, with human genome sciences. And they pointed out, well look, they got it wrong, we got it right, and we listed HIV-1 recognition in our application. We don't know what happened, I can tell you how it was resolved. And that is, the two entered into a licensing agreement. <laughs> Welcome to America. Right. So what happens is, Euroscreen is the licensing agent that every time, and they actually, Euroscreen owns the, all the portfolio of the CCR5 patents. They used to own it with ICUS, which got bought out by Eli Lilly back in September 2007. Human Genome Science is still exists. What the deal was between Euroscreen and human genome scientists, no one will know, nor will they ever find out, unless someone takes them to court. We pray for court cases because then the archive becomes open. Otherwise, they are in no, under no obligation to, to, to divulge information. So, so that's the first bit. I'll go, go through the second bit more quickly because the booze is great. Um, it's a fun story, but more importantly, this is a really fascinating story about the ways in which intellectual property law and, and molecular biology 
have redefined each other, or certainly have strained each other, in ways that are really relevant to science and technology studies, and history of science, and history of medicine. It turns out that G protein chemokine receptors, which chemokine G protein uh, receptors, which chemokine receptors are a very important part, are critical to pharmaceutical companies grow. As I said before, they're important for things like arthritis, for immune responses, for allergies, for wound trafficking, for uh, also stem blood stem cell proliferations. These are really important entities. Indeed, nearly 25% of the top 200 best-selling drugs worldwide back in 2000 regulate G protein receptor activity. Two such drugs, Prozac and Pyrazine. So these are blockbuster drugs. And to show you how, I just picked the top seven. All CCR genes have been patented. I mean, there's not one of them. As soon as you get it, you brush the patent. It. And you can see that it's important clearly to pharmaceutical companies. This is human genome science sharing Smith, Klein, Beecham. Uh, Insight, another sequencing company, has uh, chemokine receptor 14, I believe. Also, the US Department of Health. And when in doubt, say the University of California, they have more gene patents than any other nonprofit organization. Right. So they're clearly important entities in the world of molecular biology. What I want to talk about in the last 10 minutes or so is to see how it is that this has really become an emblematic case about the problems of gene patenting in four areas. The patenting of products in nature, the relationship between the written specification and the object patented, i.e., yeah, we all make mistakes, but go to Manassas. The, in the sufficiency or insufficiency of sequence homology in determining function and utility, and finally, broad utility patents. Claims not mentioned in the patent specification at all. And I'm not going to read, because otherwise I'll be here until Christmas, so I'm going to make this up. It's what we historians do best, but don't tell us, right? <laughs> so what can you not patent in the United States? The United States has had a tradition where you cannot patent products of nature. In a very famous court, Supreme Court case that I'm sure many of you know, and I'll talk about a bit more in depth, this is from this week. You cannot patent laws of nature, physical phenomena, and abstract ideas have not been held, have been held not patentable. Thus, a new mineral discovered in the earth or a new plant formed in the wild is not patentable subject matter. Likewise, Einstein could not patent the celebrated law, musical it's not MC squared, nor could Newton have patented the law of gravity. But you can patent genes. I always thought they were products of nature. Ah, but they're not. Because the argument from the PTO, the US PTO, the European Patent Office, and the, and the Japanese Patent Office, in a joint communique of 1988, Purified natural products are not regarded under any of the three laws, and uh, that's U.S. United States Code, I suppose University of Southern California Trojan, but it's not, as products of nature or discoveries because they do not in fact exist in nature as in, in an isolated form. Rather, they are regarded for patent purposes as biologically active substances and chemical compounds and are eligible for patents on the same basis as chemical. What does that mean? When you patent a gene, you do not patent the gene as it appears in your genome. You excise the intron which is the bit that interrupts that never get to the mRNA, mRNA stage. And you also put in a cloning vector, say PBR322, an oldie but goodie. You don't have PBR322 in around your genes. Therefore, the argument is, it's now a product of artifice. It's not a product of nature. Right. Uh, a rather interesting argument. Um, there have been Supreme Court decisions against publishing patent as precedents against Patenting products of nature. The first one is the American Wood Paper Patent of 1874, in which a, the, the wood paper company wanted to patent. They invented a method that mechanically and chemically uh, isolated, uh, 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 precipitated, and purified cellulose. Um, they wanted to patent the process and also cellulose. The U.S. Supreme Court said the process is great. You can patent that. You can't patent cellulose because that's a natural entity. Uh, similarly, 10 years later, Cochrane versus Badesha Ali and Zolotovic, see the German comes in somewhere. Uh, same argument, company wanted to patent uh, what they call artificial alizarine, which is a dye. It's found in the, uh, in the root of a matter plant. Is that for 10 points next to the intruder question? Uh, they invented a method to, to secrete, uh, to, sorry, to synthesize artificial uh, alizarine, and they wanted to patent what they called, quote, artificial alizarine. The problem was, chemically, artificial alizarine was the same as alizarine. It wasn't at all. It was only artificial because they synthesized it. Chemically, it was the same thing. Therefore, they could patent the process, not the entity. Finally, Funk Brothers Seed Company versus Kalo Inoculate. This was the uh, company that had seven, sorry, six bacteria that were used for fertilizing legumes. 
Turns out the bacteria had the same properties in nature as they did in the pack. The only difference was these six bacteria didn't inhibit each other, so there was enhanced growth. Um, the, the Supreme Court said, look, if it has the same characteristics in nature as it does in your patent, it's a natural product. And so the patent was revoked. Now there have been, to be fair, products of, uh, uh, examples for, for producing products of nature, patenting products of nature. First one is the famous adrenaline case. Park Davis and Company v. H.K. Mulford. The second one is Merck Company versus Olin Mathiasen. This is uh, uh, vitamin B12. In both cases, now it should be argued, these two cases, and this one as well, these two cases are not, they're federal circuit. They're not U.S. Supreme. And as I always tell lawyers, I always was taught that the U.S. Supreme trumps, that's why it's called Supreme, the federal court. Right? Uh, in these two cases, the Federal Circuit Court defended the patent because they argued that the substance had properties once it was purified that were distinct from the, prop from the entities of nature. So if you use adrenaline from a cow in nature, it actually can be very deleterious to one's health. It actually has to be purified before the effects of adrenaline help a human being. Right? The other case that gets mentioned all the time is Diamond V. Chuck. But Barney, that's insane. It's because lawyers have been doing their homework. It turns out this has absolutely nothing to do with gene patenting. It's a, it's a, bow, a pseudomonas bacteria that Chakra Barkey created in the laboratory. Uh, it's, it, it had the ability to decompose, uh, to, turn, uh, to, to degrade uh, oil into biodegradable products, rather important. Uh, so what he did is he created a bacterium using four genes that had this process. He patented the bacterium, he didn't patent the gene. Right. So this is not an example of gene patenting, and should, and should never be argued that it is gene patenting. Amgen says it is, and they're the ones who use diamond v. chocolate party, saying purified and isolated gene sequences are different from those occurring in nature. A gene is a chemical compound, albeit a complex one. Right. And it's from that point on that the idea is that genes are patentable entities because they're chemicals is, is, is written in so. Uh, and indeed, uh, it's what, as, as Greg mentioned, I'm on the, you know, the BRCA, overturning the BRCA case, uh, Judge Sweet argued that, look, the argument that somehow by excising the introns, putting it into a vector, somehow you created something different is a lawyer's trick. It's, it basically has the same properties as the, as the DNA in nature. The incorrect sequence, I'll let you read through it in boring law, basically says, uh, look, you have to be able to enable to give some uh, enable someone. It turns out that the enablement clause was that for biology was a result of a historical case in 1931 for a soil bacterium. It turns out it's damn hard to describe the soil in words of a bacterium that grows it. So just deposit it so that someone can study the soil. Right? So it was the inability of the written word to convey knowledge for biological entities. Therefore, the argument was. So for biological entities, we will accept deposits. And that's why genes were allowed to be deposited. Right? Uh, so the, the Federal Circuit Court argues in 1985, the PTO must continue to adapt its procedures to facilitate the advance of science and technology, since in the public interest and the progress of useful arts that's benefited as new technologies evolve. Which means, don't make it so difficult for the people to deposit. If they deposit it in a depository, that's enough. Don't put the burden on the description because that destroys the ability for patents to do their jobs, right? A classic example of enablement was the uh, University of California versus Eli Lilly, and the argument was a 1997 case. Uh, the argument was these people defined a gene in terms of function rather than giving its nucleotide sequence. That was Berkeley. Eli Lilly used it. Berkeley tried to sue them. Uh, the Federal Circuit Court said, no, you can't sue them because your patent wasn't valid because you did not specify the sequence. Of the, uh, they did of the rat, they didn't do it of the human insulin C DNA. So in 1997, it appears maybe hey, Hazeltine is wrong, that even if you deposit it, you still can't get it wrong. Well, it's amazing stuff there. Enzo Biochem changes the rules for about five years. I don't know, seven, eight years. It turns out that there was Enzo Biochem that had on three uh, pieces of three DNA, three sequences of DNA, sorry, three uh, viruses. That's right, three bacteria, I'll get this right, that cause, that were gonorrhea causing uh, bacteria. And they described the bacteria in terms of their function, not in terms of their genetic sequence. And they deposited the ATCC. Gene probe uses the Enzo Biochem sues. Enzo Biochem, so Gene probe said, look, you can't sue us. We didn't know what the hell you had. You said you had three bacteria that were caused gonorrhea. You didn't tell us the sequence. You said they did. There are a lot of bacteria that caused gonorrhea. 
That's true. Certainly more than three. So goes to the it goes to the district court, Southern New York. Southern New York said, yeah, that's right. It's the patent is is, is invalid. It doesn't give the, they didn't say what the sequence was. Goes to the Federal Circuit Court, Federal Circuit Court backs the ruling. But then they revisit the issue several months later on request of Enzo, and they overturn the decision. And they say, well, actually, come to think of it, we think that the deposit is sufficient. You can get the you can get the requirement wrong. As long as you deposit, anyone can visit and get the information. Uh, there was a huge disagreement among the Federal Circuit judge, Court judges. It got rather ugly. The argument is you're conflating two important bits, the enablement requirement and also the specification, which you may not do. Two, so it looks as if maybe Hazeltine is right. March 2010, Federal Circuit Court of Appeals and Ariad Pharmaceuticals versus Eli Lilly says, look, you can't conflate the two. Enzo 2 is a disastrous rule. So, if you're confused, good, because so too are the Federal Circuit Court because <laughs> they keep on changing. And it shows you what molecular biology does to intellectual property law. My favorite quote, and I have to read this because I mean, otherwise it does look like I'm making it up and I'm not, from a Federal Court Circuit Court judge is actually quite funny, um, uh, Gai Gaiarza, quote, this is our best, this thicket of written description jurisprudence is the best, uh, our, the result of our best efforts to construe an ambiguous statute only Congress reels the machete to clear this mess up. <laughs> About as good as it gets. So it shows you how fluid and how bizarre and contradictory uh, this becomes. Um, I don't want to go into this into too detail. We talk about this in, 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 the, in the discussion. Sequence homology. It turns out where the scientists really attacked hard was this notion that somehow you could use see a percentage of sequence homology and, and deduce a function by computers alone. That turns out to be totally wrong. And again, it's based on chemistry as a model. Because in chemistry, you have a very clear definition of what a predictable art is between the structure of a molecule and its function. The problem is you don't have that percentage relationship in genomics and DNA. You can have two sequences of DNA that are 99% similar that have very, the, the proteins of which have very different functions. ATPase, zinc, uh, zinc fingers, chemokine receptors. Right? So the problem is if you sit there and want to have a model, as we do in chemistry, prime facial case of obvious may be made when chemical compounds are very close structural homology. So homologous compounds differing regularly by the successive addition of the same chemical group are generally of sufficiently close structural similarity, but there's a presumed expectation that such compounds possess similar properties. You can't say that in molecular biology. It, the DNA could be so close. It could be an irrelevant switch. It could be a third nucleotide of a codon, because the wobble hypothesis, it doesn't matter what the third one is. It could be a switch of one hydrophobic amino acid for another hydrophobic amino acid. Or it could be a switch that affects a, uh, affects a, uh, a disulfide bridge in a cysteine-cysteine amino acid. You cannot come up with a mathematical expression of relationship of function with DNA. And that's a huge problem. For, uh, broad utility value. Um, uh, it turns out that the real problem, as scientists also point out, is that it's huge, it, it's the utility. And it turns out in U.S. intellectual property law, if you get a patent, if you, if you patent a product patent, a composition of matter patent, which is, jet, which is straightforward in chemistry, again, it's applying chemistry to molecular biology, not only, the only thing you have to do is show one use. So if I have a chemical, and it turns out it's a detergent, and I get the product patent and I patent its use as a detergent. You determine it's also a fertilizer, be a bizarre chemical, what the hell. Uh, you have to pay me royalties because I have the composition of matter patent. Right. You can file another patent on its use as whatever I said it was going to be used for, but you still have to pay a license agreement with me because I own technically the chemical. Same is true with the genes. And again, it's about adapting intellectual property law for genetic, for, for, for genetic. Francis Collins, Harold uh, Chris Coe is the head of the uh, Human Genome Project, Harold Warren is a Nobel laureate, so this is insane. But the notion of somehow that you, know, you can lock up all subsequent uses of a gene without knowing what in the world it does is absurd. What's the USPTO's response? Because they were pretty good. They asked for the responses for the utility guidelines. Mitch Solston wrote in, Varmus wrote in. It's a who's who of molecular biologists saying, you've got to change this crap. This is a disaster. Um, Solston, Aaron Klug, who was the head of the uh, uh, British Royal Society, I believe, was president before. Bruce Alberts was the, at the time, president of the National Academy of Sciences. They all said, look, this is mindless crap, that you can get machines to do this, or monkeys to do this. Oh, okay, good thing before. Ah, uh, uh, good thing, I almost have the conclusion. 
Uh, it doesn't matter, the USPTO did not follow any of their advice guidelines. They said, look, it's America, you name one, one function, you've got it, you lock up all the Congress has to make the change, not the USPTO. This, the sequence homology is the only thing they listen to, and they're, they're a bit stricter now about sequence homology we talked about this. Uh, the moral to the story of the inclusion group. Uh, what's the status of the CCR5 pattern? Three entities have tried to torpedo it in Europe. Strawman Limited is a company that uh, stands for, is for companies that want to be non uh, anonymous. An 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 um, Hop La Roche and Pro, uh, Progenix Pharmaceuticals, uh, they filed their patent attack torpedoes opposition 2005. It still has not been resolved. Why? Because they're making chemicals, not surprisingly, to the CCR5, to bind to the CCR5, and there are a new group of chemicals on the market now. One called Silzentry, uh, also known as Marat Maravaric. Marat, it's bizarre, it's not Maraviric, that is probably incorrect. Um, and the reason why I bring this up is that there is a company in New York that I'm not allowed to mention who has an asset. If you want to take Silzentry, it's there are two types of HIV1, uh, deutotropism. What is the M which binds to CCR5, the other is T-tropic that binds to CXCR4. If you have T-tropic, Silzentry will not help you because it binds to CCR5. So you need a test to see what you have, M or T-tropic. It's done by Monogram Biosciences, uh, $2,800. It's called the Trophil Assay. Another company has created a cheaper assay for $300. So the moral to the story is that historians have for for we haven't been around at all, for decades, I've talked about science is rarely kind of disconnected from social interests or, you know, or financial, you know, financial capital. But it seems to me now there's something really intrinsically different with gene patenting. And the 1990s, and this is a fascinating story because it's a time when the instability of a patent claim is going on, the instability of sequence homology determined function, the instability of about what, uh, what is the relationship between that which is patented and what the specification said. All of these are being redefined as well as what are the proper kind of tools of molecular biology to determine the function of, of, a, of a protein are all being debated. And it's all up for grabs in the 1990s. No, no one really knows how it was going precip to precipitate out. We still don't know that to this day. So it says much was and still is at stake. Oh, no, a bit over, sorry. No, 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 thank no. you very much. If, you, if you're shy and you don't want to ask questions, you can always send me an email. But I'm over there. And also for dry, I can ask, answer questions at dreams. But if anyone wants to uh, ask a few questions or make a few comments before. But yes, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm a scientist working on CCF5. Oh. I've heard this story from all different, uh, right. from John Moore and all. Uh, sure, yeah. And so, yeah. yeah, because he was a big uh, yeah. speaker on that. Oh. Well, that's raising for me an issue right now because mm -hmm. we, we're still continuing uh, all the research and mm -hmm. there's a lot of funding from the research council that we get right. to, in a way, now we test a lot of the confirm that the pharmaceutical industry mm -hmm. haven't been able to use as a HIV blocker, right. but that the patient wants to study further than he can do. Right. Out of that, a lot of spin-off of universities are coming out. Right. Which are developing new compound on university and M mm -hmm. MRC or mm -hmm. one component. Mm -hmm. If we find a key compound, what's going to happen? That's a very good question. I wish I knew. I mean, that, we, we still, I mean, that's still up for grabs, and we're still waiting for the EPO to decide. I actually checked it last, because you can check the EPO every day. You see, there hasn't been an update now since 2010. Um, my hunch is I would be surprised if they overturned the patent. There was a similar a patent attack on Progenix, on a chemo counter that the EPO said no, that it's legit, it's a legit patent. And, they, and people actually think that they did this in 2008, right? So people think that the EPO will back the patent, that they will not change the patent. But I mean, part of the question is, what happens if we do do this? You know, will spin-offs be destroyed? Pro I mean, yeah, I think it's going to be... The interesting thing is, it's going to change the landscape of, of entities. One important point that people tend to forget is that if you're working on... If you're getting a grant from the NIH, or the NSF, and I don't have used to hear about Europe, you cannot use that money to pay royalties. You're not allowed to or licensing, it's true in Europe as well. So there are a lot of, you know, and ironically, of the BRCA1, BRCA2 gene, uh, one third of the funding came from the NIH for that, for that sequence, right? So the NIH actually is backing the, the ACMI team, so, and, and they have said, I've spoken to their technology transfer, they said, if there is a gene that people they feel are, and they thought about nuking CCR5, right, because they also had these labs that the NIH were funded with 
NIH money. They said if they if they felt that Hazeltine or Euroscreen were using it, you know, and, 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 and for nonprofits, uh, that they would go after them because they wouldn't do that. The NIH would not go after them. So the answer is, what will happen to spinoffs? No one really knows. I mean, it's something that is it's a spiral. It's no, that's exactly. Oh, that's so exactly. Really going to, this be big castles Well, that's that's why I was so shocked at the Judge Street's ruling because I mean. I don't know. I know German soccer really well. I don't know English soccer. But there must have been a time in the FA Cup when a Division Three team beat like Man United, right? <laughs> it was like that. I mean, the fact is that because the judge didn't say Myriad is an idiot, I, there, I therefore torpedo the BRCA1 two genes. He basically said all genes, not just human genes. I mean, Monsanto, for example, is getting very. I mean, all of the genes in, in agrobiotech are also now, you know, under scrutiny. Uh, that's why it was such a shock, it was such a radical statement to say, yeah, no, genes are products of nature, so no gene should be patented. I'm shocked it's gotten this far. Uh, uh, it's the biggest upset since I'm an American football fan, the Giants beat the Patriots in the Super Bowl. Um, I would be shocked if it got backed all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. I'd be very shocked. Um, uh, certainly the European panel office is following it, I don't know the Japanese panel, but the European panel is very closely following it, precisely because the CCR5 research in you know, Europe screen in Europe is huge, right? It's a huge reset worldwide. It's a huge kind of blockbuster drug target. Uh, that said, the drugs against it haven't been as successful as we hoped. I mean, Solzentri is the only drug that FDA has approved, right? It's kind of like the spearhead for many things to come, of course. No, exactly. It's CCR5, but... Right. No, exactly right. That's exactly right. I mean, for, for it's the first, hopefully, of many uh, entry inhibitors, non-fusion entry inhibitors. But even wider biological. Oh no, biological for now. We're talking about uh, buffer bi elucidating kind of viral uh, uh, CD4 or viral cell virus to host cell interactions. Absolutely critical. Yeah. So now it's a, it, that's why it's a fascinating. As a historian, I always cheat and say I can't predict what will happen, but it will be amazing things that will happen uh, if this gets. You know, change. I mean, what will certainly happen is that the NI federal funding will have to pick up this mm -hmm. act, and I'm not convinced that will happen. Um, Graham has a question, but before he asks, I just want to clarify in that final exchange for, for those of us who are outside. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's just um, so from what you just said is uh, is it the case that people who suffer from AIDS are now beginning to benefit from yes. knowledge yes. about CCR5 yes. role in yes. all of this? Cells entry was marketed in 2007. FDA approved sorry, 2007. Pfizer, who paid royalties, who could afford to pay royalties yes. to, to uh, just a review from uh, Martin that came out about yes, that's right. four years ago. That's right. Yes, it's the the, the the is it the Promise One, Promise Two studies uh, for a cell's entry. So it was approved initially as with other with protease inhibitors, mm -hmm. right? As of 2009, it can protease inhibitors for people who are already treatment experienced. 2009, it was approved by the, by the HIV, by the FDA for um, uh, treatment. Uh, uh, it can be the first line of treatment for patients who haven't received other treatment. So yes, people, and I've talked to uh, Mark Hamilton, who's the head of uh, TAG, Treatment Activism, because active, his office is just two blocks down from my office in NYU. And, talk, and basically, the uh, uh, the AIDS com uh, HIV AIDS community members are very upset because it's a very expensive drug. Mm -hmm. It's about thirteen thousand dollars a year for for a cell entry alone. Um, whether or not your insurance cover it, because this is the United States now, so there's no notion of you know of healthcare accessibility. So it's a huge debate. They were very upset that cell entry price Pfizer priced it so high, and, uh, and so they've been rather active to try to push. It. I mean, the, the fantasy has always been that with detailed molecular knowledge of something like the, that protein in the cell membrane, that a drug company could actually design mm -hmm. a, a chemical that would interfere mm -hmm. with it, uh, the docking of yep. the virus. Yep. And it, is that what's happening? That's, what's happening. Yes. That's right. exactly what's happening. It binds to the CCR5 so that the GP, the, the glycoprotein 120 of HIV, cannot bind to it, therefore the virus cannot intercalate itself with the host DNA. Okay, thank you. Graham? Uh, um, yeah, um, do you, I, yeah, in response to those who say you need patenting, mm -hmm. uh, patenting genes to encourage investment, I mean, do you think that one of the perverse effects of gene patenting is that it makes bad, bad business models look plausible when they... When they no, I, I, that's a good point. I think the answer to that is yes, because 
I mean, like I said, there have, you know, I gave this paper Caltech in <coughs> Baltimore with the audience, right? And, you know, he liked it, thank God. But he was president manager, right? And so the argument, he argues is, well, look, we're not, we're not going to reap the rewards from patents. Guess what Amgen's not going to do? I said, yeah, they're not going to do research. The problem is, is that my, it's, gonna, it's not that research is not going to be done. We have studies that have shown that gene tests have originated before the whole patent scandal started because of money with NIH. NIH actually funds most of the fundamental research for, for clinical testing, right? So that a different type of research will be done if we take away gene patents. Um, surely a lot of small companies have benefited, HGS and Euroscreen have benefited from intellectual property. There are other companies, the one I can't mention, that cannot benefit because they don't have the capital, although they have a great test that has been, that has been published. Uh, the results would have been published, they cannot bring it to market because they cannot afford to pay the licensing agreement of, of, uh, of, of, of Euroscreen HGS, and because they're not a public institute, they're not a, they're for profit, they're not a non-profit, they're not going to be able to, to get around that. So the interesting thing is that it's going to change the dynamic of research in ways that we haven't been able to predict. That's why I think the decision was such a radical one by Judge. So yeah, for good example, I mean, the, the notion that, oh my gosh, uh, research and development is going to be destroyed. I don't think that's true. I think it's going to change the shape and the funding of relationships and who gets to do what will be changed. But it's not that somehow the whole thing is going to be destroyed. I think that bit of that scare tax is pharmaceutical company, the biotech company. Yeah. But again, I think that's something that, as I said, that should be the object of research rather than a given, right? Mm -hmm. Don't assume that to be the case or not the case. Give examples of the ways in which that's the case. Right? But the problem is, because I'll be brief, the problem is that companies don't open up the books. No. You know, I'm a, being a 19th century German historian, right? They're all dead, so no one cares about what you write, right? But the, this notion of somebody they don't share knowledge, they won't share knowledge, they don't even respond to you, really bothers me in a fundamental kind of yeah. enlightenment way. Right? Mm -hmm. and that's what bothers me. Uh, I just wondered about the utility of mm -hmm. because my sense was that it was scandalous that they shared got patents or mm -hmm. something, but they didn't have a clue Correct. what it did. Mm -hmm. My sense is that that has been tightened up, but the USPTO guidelines say, what was it, credible? I'm trying to remember the phrase. Credible evidence of function of, of use. Yes. Correct. Yes. That's right. How, that's, but they still would have passed this patent because they're, the argument is the chemo kind of That's that, correct. That's right. sufficient. And that's sufficient? That's sufficient. Okay. Yeah. Because that's specific enough to be, if they said it's a receptor, they would have said, no. You say a chemokine receptor, yeah. they'll say fine. Okay. So it yeah. still it does. It does. So it's so they particularly where the utility really got that were really got focused in was on express sequence tags, ESTs, mm -hmm. because that's where they said this was the first generation. Right. They said no, you can't. Yeah, you've yeah. got to be give a specific utility. So it's really on ESTs where there are much stronger uh, utility requirements than on actual whole gene, whole gene pieces. And is that the same in Europe still? Yes. Actually, no. To be fair, the Europeans have a... The Europeans, for example, sequence homology, the Europeans have always said, and TRIPS, TRIPS is the thing that tries to bring all the, main, the three major things together. Uh, the Europeans and the Japanese have always said, we do not, you cannot get a patent on sequence homology alone. Right. right? So the Americans have tightened that up a bit, starting 2007. They want other evidence. It doesn't have to be empirical. For the Europeans and the Japanese, you need to have empirical, what they call wet biochemistry as a backup to the sequence homology. The sequence homology fetish was the typically American one. The Europeans and Japanese were always skeptical in granting patents for utilities based solely on sequence homology. Yes, one question. In terms of patents being, being granted or if applied, mm -hmm. you can do that. Do, do, do we see a decrease in those going through? And also, how much of a kind of a sub-trader or sub are still out there floating? Around? That's a very good question. Uh, depend, the Europeans, it's much more, not much more, it's more, the Europeans have a more stringent requirement in the sense that they reject more human patents than the Americans do. You also have a morality clause, which Americans will never have. Uh, although, although it has been used in some of the gene patents, particularly in BRCA1, that's not the reason why they nuke BRCA1. Right? So there's never been a ruling using a moral clause in order to destroy a gene. Yeah. Um, so the Europeans have a higher nuke rate ratio than the Americans do. Uh, there have been much less gene patents going through the USPTO than the 90s, the heydays, because of this. Also after the announcement, they're being very cautious about doing this. We know that one-fifth of our genome has been patented 
as of 2000. We think that probably another half are still, because it now takes about between three and four years uh, in the patent office, uh, sorry, 2005. Uh, in the patent office. So we don't know. There are still thousands, tens of thousands of genes, or thousands of genes, probably tens of thousands of patents in the USPTO. They, but again, they don't, they don't have to announce that they received the application. Right? That's still private until after it's awarded. Then they announce when it was done. So there's a lot of backlog talking to people in the, the PTO, and they're certainly not going through the way they went through in the 1990s. So there's a lot more to be discussed, and I hope you'll help us carry on the conversation just outside over a glass of wine. Uh, but before we get there, it remains only to thank Miles for an absolutely terrific talk and a great discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you.